So tonight we're talking about uh, a mystery, we're sharing a mystery. The, 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 the mystery is that this is no thing being everything. All there is is no thing being everything. All there is is the formless form. Oneness, wholeness. There is only wholeness. Everything is whole. Even that that feels it's not whole is wholeness, feeling that it's not whole. And wholeness, oneness is a word you could use for everything. I like the word energy, so all there is is energy. There's simply energy. And energy is everything. Energy is the universe, the earth, motor cars, feelings, thoughts, flowers, everything. Everything is just energy. Being all of those things, appearing as all of those things. And energy is totally free. It has no nothing that controls it. There's no God, no consciousness controlling or influencing energy. Energy has nothing else but itself. It simply is free without any influence of any kind. And also energy is like a magician. Energy can be anything at all, anything. Energy can move faster than light and at the same time be zero, be nothing. So also energy uh, is because it's free, energy can also be limited. If it couldn't be limited, it couldn't be free because it's everything. And so it can be limited. And so it's a boundless energy that then can apparently become contracted. And that contracted energy can arise in the human physiology. Human beings get a sense of a contraction at a very early age. And that when that contraction seems to happen, then, there's a, a, then what arises with that is a sudden sense of identity, a self-identity arises. Suddenly, there's a sense of separation, and there's something in here that then becomes a summer. It feels very real to the someone, the someone that takes form in here, that seems to take form suddenly, grows and seems to grow and live with in a world full of other someones, other me's, what I call me's, lots of me's. And so there's a feeling, a very strong feeling that this me, this self, this identity, this individual is real. I am a real person. And I live in a real world. The world is real. And I live in a real story. It's the story of me. And there are other people living in their story. But my story is my story. It's my real story. And I have free will and choice. I have free will and choice to influence my story and try and make it better. It doesn't always work. <laughs> but that's what I can do. I can make my story work, the story of me. And so the individual grows up in that world with that sort of belief. And lots of other people believe the same thing. But one of the things that may not be noticed by many, many people, but by some sensitive people more noticed, in that, in that reality, in which that me lives, uh, there's, there's a sense of being separate from everything. Because in that reality that seems to arise only in that identification, that, the story of me, that reality, everything is experienced as a subject-object. There's a subject of me, and everything else is an object out there. So the, the me, can only live in the experience of being subject, in, living in subject-object reality. What I call the separate reality. It seems to the me to be real. But what's being suggested here is that that reality is actually illusory. And even the whole sense of there being me is also illusory. But for the me it feels real. And for me, being separate from everything feels real. So me, the, the individual, never really sees the sky. 
never sees a tree, never really sees an individual, another individual, or the walls, or anything, as they naturally are. The individual sees them as a separate object. And that experience is deeply dissatisfying in some way. Many, most people wouldn't even say it's like that. But for some people who are sensitive, more sensitive, there seems to be a lack. Something is missing. There's something wrong with my life. There's something missing in my life. There's something else. I know there's something else. What is that something else? And so uh, people become seekers of that something else. They might become Christians or Buddhists or they might go to a therapist or they might also hear about something called enlightenment. And enlightenment sounds as though it could be the answer. So they go to a teacher of enlightenment. Because, of course, they've grown up believing, feeling, feeling strongly that they have to do it. I have to make my life work. And if there's something lacking in my life, then I can learn how to be fulfilled. So they go to somebody who is offering to teach them to how to become fulfilled. And uh, always there's a list. If you become a Christian, you get a list. You mustn't sin. And you, uh, <laughs> if you go to a therapist, you get a list. You have to forgive your mother and honour, honour your anger and all of that. You're, you're given things to do. And if you go to a teacher of enlightenment, you're given a list like self-inquiry or meditation or being pure. I had a lot of trouble when I was a seeker with the idea of being pure. It just didn't work for me. <laughs> all of those things, like a letting go, being open to oneness, all of those things, somehow subtly, subtly are a way of telling you and me that they, it has to change. You have to become more silent, more open, whatever. So all of those all of those teachings about becoming fulfilled are about you, for me, becoming worthy of fulfillment. You have to become worthy. So what we're doing, what we're sharing here today, is the possibility that the whole of that effort to try and find fulfillment for the seeker, the one, the, the, the me, the self, is utterly and wonderfully futile. It's wonderfully futile because the seeker will never find what it longs for because the seeker can only exist and live in a finite reality, in a subject-object reality. That's the only place it exists. That's what it's there for, to deal with a finite reality, to try and find a way through that finite reality. So it's absolutely uh, hopeless for the seeker to try and find fulfillment. Because fulfillment is, is the infinite. And the finite can't find the infinite. The only possibility is that in some way or other, um, that, that energy, that contracted energy that lives in that artificial reality can suddenly collapse. Suddenly be no more. So what we're talking about Tonight, what is on offer here is the possibility of uh, a, a complete loss. It's about the death of being. It's about the end of the individual that lives in this artificial reality. It's about the end of the artificial reality. So it's about a loss rather than anything that <coughs> me can have. This is not about the me getting anything. This is about the me losing everything. So we can share together ideas about me and you know, verbally, and that's quite uh, that can that can bring a sort of clarity. But clarity and understanding is not liberation. It's only something again that me can have more of a clarity about its own nature and the nature of reality. So we can talk together and share those ideas. But there's something else that goes on in this sort of gathering together, which is absolutely beyond words. It's energetic. 
as I said at the beginning, separation is an energy that's embodied. It's a cellular sense of living in a separate reality. It's felt in the whole body. It's not an idea or belief. It's, a, it's, a, it's an energetic contraction that, that the me lives in. A sort of tension, a sort of subtle agitation. And what can seem to happen, what can seem to happen, is that that whole sense of contraction can suddenly evaporate back into where it came from. Um, so that's, that's what can happen, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Question. Um, if everything I try to do is to attempt to change anything, it's yeah. just the seeker doing something. Yeah. So what is then about uh, just living a nice life and hoping to enlightenment to happen? No, there isn't anyone that can do that. <laughs> Unfortunately, me can't just lie back and be open to the idea that there is oneness and it's only one idea in the, in the, in the, in the seeker. So the, the, the energy of, see, of, the, of the me, the self, the I, directly arises, directly that sense of, of separation <coughs> arises in the tiny child. And it, it, all it can do is seek home again. Okay? It just goes on and on seeking to find home. So the idea that it could relax and let go and just let life happen is ludicrous. The far as the nature of me is concerned. Me is seeking. Me is the story of seeking. It never ends because there is nothing to see. It's already this. This is it. So why, why would there be anything to see? Do we arise at home when we leave our bodies? Um, when the body actually dies in the normal sense of that word, when the body dies, what dies with it is the function of awareness, of, of self-awareness. So at the point when the body dies, it has to be at that point, not near death. When the body dies, and what dies with it is the function of awareness, self-awareness. So there's nothing there. I mean, I'm, and in a sense, this is death. You know, in, in when, when when the seeker is no more, that's a sort, that's a death, the death of something that is is seeking something. It happens in the living body or when the body dies. And of course, also this message, you know, this, this, this communication is not about somebody coming to know something. This all this leads to is unknown. that happens to me one day? Sorry. So I cannot do anything but hope for realization that happens to me one day? No, but it's worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't that you can't do anything. This message is not saying that you can't do anything. It's saying there is no you. The idea of you is an illusory energy in the body, held in the body. There's no you. There's nothing to do. And you know, the problem for me is that it's continually waiting for what will be. So it's always waiting to become enlightened or to have to, to reach self-realization. And most teachings about enlightenment, virtually all teachings about enlightenment, are promising self-enlightenment. That the self will become enlightened. And that's a total illusion. It's the self is so um, locked into its own world and it so uh, longs for something else that the problem is that it can't see beyond its own identity so it gathers in everything for itself. It gathers in riches, lovers, power, victimhood and in love. It tries to take all those things in for itself. And, and, and that that endless hunger will never ever be satisfied. Because what it really longs for is everything. It tries to gather in all these things to find everything in it. Only when it 
dies, suddenly collapses, and there's nothing left thereafter there is ever. This is it. Uh, in your talks, you always say we should be a perfect lover. In the perfect lover. Yeah. In the this is the perfect, the perfect lover. Is the only thing that's in this room. What's happening to you right now is is the perfect lover is speaking to you. The perfect lover is speaking to you through your feelings, thoughts, sounds. Everything that's happening to you is the perfect lover singing this song of freedom. Apparently. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so there is only the beloved. Can you say there is only now and change? I don't, I'm not very keen on the word now. <laughs> now implies now and then. There is no now. There is no moment. There is only what is and what is not. So everything in this room that appears is both real and unreal. <laughs> That's the mystery. The mystery we're living in, the mystery that is being lived, is the mystery that this is no thing appearing as this. So this is real and it's unreal. It's real in that it seems to appear, it's unreal in that it's no thing. But the me is incapable of seeing that because the me lives in a subject object. But everything that's happening to the me is the beloved. Saying, I'm here already, you don't have to go anywhere, I'm here, hello, <coughs> hello. 